Hi, I'm Adam Hussein for WEVN. With me today is Professor Doug Strzok, a for former foreign correspondent for the Baltimore Sun and which else again? And the Washington Post. And the Washington Post. How are you today, Professor? Fine. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So, um, when did you, I believe you lived in Cairo, correct? I did. I lived there, uh, I had an apartment there for about six years from 1990, the first Gulf War to 96, and then I returned regularly to the Middle East uh, when I worked for the Washington Post until about 2007. So, President Hosni Mubarak, he's been in power for 30 years now, so when you were there, did you feel, did, did you feel any sort of opposition to him or any sort of unease among people who lived there? Well, you know, it's curious, he, he certainly, certainly there was always opposition, but he was very uh, clever and very um, adamant about keeping that opposition under his thumb. But the difference between Egypt and some of the other authoritarian regimes in the Middle East is that there wasn't, there wasn't a, a, a visceral hatred for the regime as there was, for example, in, in, uh, in Iraq under Saddam, or even in Syria under Assad. Uh, Mubarak was seen by his people as, uh, as uh, an autocrat. He was seen not, uh, he was not beloved by any stretch of the imagination, but they didn't hate him. And uh, for the most part, Egyptians, if they stayed out of politics, were able to pursue their lives um, as best they could under the regime. So why this opposition now? What sort of triggered all of the protests happening there now? Well, what triggered it probably was Tunisia, was the events in Tunisia and, and the success by the protesters in Tunisia uh, in ridding themselves of an authoritarian regime. And, and I think that emboldened uh, some folks in, in Egypt to begin it. But the, the, the underlying cause of this protest is really the lack of opportunity that Egyptians have had. It is a, it's a poor country. More than 40% of the Egyptians are living in poverty. They don't have a future. Even the college graduates who are trained in some of the good universities in Egypt uh, have very little future. Poor folks have very little future. And of course, politically, they have no say in their future. And, and those kind of frustrations are what boiled up into the, into the growing demonstrations we saw in Tahrir Square. So last night, well, or yesterday, it was last night for them, but for us about 3.30, there was all these reports boiling up about Mubarak coming out and saying his resignation, but then that didn't happen. What did you sort of make of his speech? I, I thought it was a real missed opportunity. I thought it was a, it was a, a, a terrible shame and a sad uh, moment for Egypt because he had the opportunity at that point to to, to bow out gracefully. And he would, have, he would have won the appreciation of his people had he said any number of ways he could have spun it. I am a son of Egypt. I have given my life to Egypt. It is now time to pass it on to others. I will retire gracefully to his home in Sharm el-Sheikh. And he could have uh, you know, been a elderly statement, statesman from there. Instead, he just stubbornly is clinging to powers for uh, a, a few more months if, he, if, if, you're, if he's to be believed that he would step down in September. And uh, it really is unfortunate because instead of winning the, 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 the appreciation of his people, he just fueled their anger. Why do you think he is really forcing to stay in power until September? Well, that's the big puzzle. That's Certainly he surprised not only the people in Tahrir Square, but he surprised the U.S. government, which uh, you know, the director of the CIA was predicting that he was going to step down earlier in the day. So that's the big question. Why is he clinging to, to this even though uh, it's clear what the final chapter is going to be? The only thing that's unclear is when it's going to be. And uh, there are those who say he's out of touch. Perhaps that's true. Um, he's 82, he's been in power for a long time, he's used to a way of doing things. Uh, if you, if you when you live in Egypt you, and you have any contact with the government, you very quickly become confronted with forms, with, with bureaucratic forms. And these are always typewritten forms with carbon paper in there to make multiple copies. And he's still living in that age when, in fact, the people in Tyre Square are on Facebook and 
using Twitter and, and seeing what's going on in the rest of the world on the internet. And I, I fear that the time has passed him and he doesn't realize it. You brought up the U.S. government and Facebook. Um, I've been seeing a lot of Facebook statuses. People are talking about the situation a lot. And one status that I saw was that the reason Mubarak is still in power is because of the U.S. government wanting him in power. Do you think that's true? Oh, certainly that has been the case in the past. I think right now uh, President Obama is considering whether that has to change, whether the U.S. Is, has looked embarrassing because of this whole situation. But in the past, uh, Egypt has been a cornerstone of U.S. policy, and we have counted on Mubarak to, to continue the foreign policy that he has, to continue the relationship he's had with Israel, to, con to continue his role in, in the Arab world. And, and we've counted on him being there and supported him. There's no doubt about it. We give uh, more money to Egypt, more U.S. taxpayer money goes to Egypt than any other country except Israel. And so uh, he has long been an ally, long been a stalwart. Um, the irony is that in 2009, President Obama went to Cairo, gave a very stirring speech, which was, is, is, is well known in, in, in Egypt and in the Arab world about the benefits of democracy. And now when push comes to shove, the U.S. is looking uh, to, to the protesters in the street as being hypocritical. And now, last, or as of this morning, Mubar the military is now behind Mubarak. Do you think that this is their own decision, or do you think that Mubarak has a hand in them telling protesters I to I think that's leave? not quite clear where they are now. There was a statement, as you said, this morning that the military says we support Mubarak. But yesterday, uh, two top commanders of the military came to Tahrir Square and said, we, we're, about, we're, we are in support of the people, we're in support of the protests, all of your demands will be met. Um, so there seems to be mixed messages coming from the military. And I even today, as the uh, protesters have marched to other parts of Cairo out of Tahrir Square, uh, the military has not reacted against them. So uh, one can only hope that there is, that, that the military continues to try to straddle this or maybe stay independent of it, um, because unfortunately, um, they are going to be the deciding factor here. Unfortunately, there is a confrontation. Both sides, Mubarak and the protesters, have really painted themselves into a corner, and the only, the only conclusion is a confrontation, and the military would be the one to settle that. If Mubarak did resign yesterday, who do you think would step up and sort of start ruling the country or move towards some sort of? Well, that's, that's a big question. And as you saw today, uh, France and some of the other European countries are saying, wait a minute, let's, let's think about the next step before the protests get so much momentum, so much steam that there's no option except a vacuum. And that is exactly what the U.S. is worried about and, and, and Europeans are worried about, is that, that if there's no good transition of power from Mubarak to some other party, uh, perhaps this revolution, which has a lot of different reasons for it, but perhaps this revolution will be hijacked by the Muslim Brotherhood, by Islamic uh, uh, radicals. So they're worried about that vacuum. The U.S. has counted on Omar Suleiman, the vice president, to take uh, the charge of, of transferring power from Mubarak to some more democratic uh, regime in September. but. Suleiman has shown himself in the last day or so, and particularly last night, uh, to be such a loyalist of Mubarak that he may not be acceptable to, uh, to the folks on the street. So uh, there's a big question mark there. Now, after Mubarak gave his speech last night, Tahrir Square just sort of blew up in anger. Do you think there's any fear of how the protesters might, might react going forward? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I had feared, as many other people had feared, that today, or even last night, there would be, for example, a march on the palace or uh, an attempt to take over the, the, uh, the government-controlled uh, television station there, um, and that that would result in violent clashes. Uh, it hasn't happened. As a matter of fact, the protesters marched to the television station. And they apparently, according to reports this morning, uh, broke down some barbed wire was there, but then elements of the protesting crowd put it back up again 
and the crowds were chanting, peaceful, peaceful, peaceful. So they are trying not to be lured into what some of the protesters see as a trap of, of getting into v a violent confrontation with the military. So uh, I if that continues, it will be inspiring. It will be fascinating. It will be even thrilling to watch. And if, if both sides of this can somehow come to a conclusion without bloodshed, without further bloodshed, that will be great. Do you think there is a possibility of a military takeover? There's always that threat, always in the Middle East. And the military, military has really been the behind the scenes power in Egypt for a long time. They were, uh, you know, Mubarak himself was a military commander. He came out of the military as did his predecessors. Um, and it is always assumed that the support of the military is absolutely necessary for whatever government uh, comes out of this or whatever government rules in Egypt. And so the assumption is that the military holds the key, that if they truly marched into Mubarak and said your time's up, then his time would be up. And that apparently hasn't happened yet. As we heard the other day, Turkey sort of sees itself as a governmental model for Egypt and sees themselves as the new big brother leader of the Middle East. Do you think that's true or do you think that they do have a model that Egypt could? I, I think that's, that's exaggerating a little bit the role that Turkey plays in the Middle East, um, probably even exaggerating a little bit the, the role that they think they can play because it's, it's, not, a, it's not an Arab country. It is not um, a country whose eyes are really toward the Middle East as much as Europe. And they've long wanted to join the European uh, Union and, and, and still do. So uh, Turkey is a fascinating model in that they have accepted uh, elements of, uh, of Islam in the government. They have stepped back from the secular uh, reg secular government that they used to hold so clearly ever since their founding as a modern nation. Um, and it is a f and it's a modern and a pretty well working and a growingly affluent country. So um, uh, there are lots of folks in Egypt who say, look to Turkey for uh, a model of how we can do it. But will Turkey ever be the leader of the Middle East as, as Egypt has long uh, fancied itself to be? No. Now, there have been two protests here in Boston standing in solidarity with the people in Egypt. Do you think that these protests are having any sort of effect or influencing the U.S. government or doing anything really to help the situation? I, I think what they're doing is, is keeping the conversation alive. They are they're keeping local television stations and local news stations, um, giving them a local angle to continue to report on this. Uh, do I think the protests are affecting U.S. foreign policy? No. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's always good to keep this on, on the lips of, of folks in this country and for people to realize that there are a lot of connections between the United States and, and Egypt and for people to realize that we in this country um, have made great claims about what a model of democracy we offer and what a model of democracy we, uh, we hope to export to the rest of the world. And now comes the question of whether we're really doing it or not. Now, some people have been, I guess, rumoring that there have been a lot, a lot of people have been focusing on Egypt and paying attention to it. And some people are wondering if some of the attraction is almost like a new political fad or the cool <laughs> new thing to be paying attention and updating your statuses to seem involved. Do you think that people are just giving it attention because it's so big now? Or are people actually vested in the situation? Any people in this country? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. I think, I think what's gone on in Egypt is uh, transfixing to anybody who has, well, it's a great story. You have, you have the internet age coming to bear. You have the, the poor uh, people of Egypt who are rising up to say we need more opportunity. You have this element of, uh, of Islamic growing movement. And you have this massive, massive uh, drama that's going on that's being played out in front of live cameras, although uh, live with some restrictions because there's been a great deal of, of difficulty for the journalists there, a great deal of danger. 
but you have a drama that's playing out, and I, I, I can't help but think that it's, it's absolutely fascinating to, to anybody who has this, the slightest interest in the rest of the world. What do you think will happen next? I mean, I know that's a really difficult <laughs> question to answer, but if there was anything that could come from this, what do you think it would be? I, I think it is foolish to try to predict the future. Clearly, the governments of the Middle East have not predicted the kinds of growing um, public protests that, that have boiled up in the last, uh, in the last two months since uh, Tunisia began and since uh, uh, Egypt has, has been ignited in these protests. There's been uh, protests in Jordan. There's been attempts to do a little bit in Syria, although the iron fist of the, the government there has kept it out. Uh, Yemen, Algeria, all of these places have been affected by this story that they're seeing in other countries, in Egypt and in Tunisia. Uh, so clearly nobody is predicting very well uh, these events and, and I would be foolish to try to predict where it will go. Uh, I think it's clear that Mubarak's time is over. It's, it is simply a matter of when he finally leaves and I think the big question is will he leave um, with, without a great deal of bloodshed or will there be violence? Is there anything else you'd like to add? Or? No, you've asked all the right questions. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, My Professor. My pleasure.